the box seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Hi everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Your Box Seat. Yes, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. A little bit later into the week for the record because we've just come off the back of the fifth New Zealand bloodstock yearling sales, <coughs> both in Auckland at Karaka and of course in Christchurch. Uh, we've got plenty on the show for you today. Reviewing those, we'll also have a look at what happened at Cambridge last week for NZB Harness Million Nye. We've got some preview, a couple of tips, bit of a result last week for our Breast Cancer Foundation. Foundation and Michael Guerin. It's a sad time in harness racing because one of our greats left us last week. He did, Greg. Um, big hi to you and hi to all our viewers around Australia and New Zealand. Uh, yeah, the end of an era, and it's an era which has been eroded in the last 12 months. We had the passing of the great Roy Purden, who was the doyen of trainers February last year. Well, the man who sat in the sulky for so many of Roy's great horses, Peter Wolfenden, uh, passed uh, on the weekend. Um, a, a true legend. There's no other word to describe him in the first instance. He was laconic. He was a genius in the sulky. His name will always be tied to the greatest of all standard breeds in Australasia in Cardigan Bay. But had there been no Cardigan Bay there still would have been a wolfie. When I first got to Northern Harness Racing, Greg, now that was 1990, so that's over 30 years ago. Wolfie was just starting to get away from driving. He was semi-retired, but the reverence which the other drivers, not just me, because as a kid growing up, Peter Wolfenden was almost too big to think about. You never thought you were going to meet Peter Wolfenden. But when you got to the driver's room, he was very rarely there. He was very rarely active in those days because Glenn had come on board as the stable driver. But the way that Tony Hurley here in particular, and I've spoken to Tony many times about this, the way he spoke about Peter Wolfenden and the way the other drivers spoke about and treated Peter Wolfenden, it was Richie McCaw-like, it was Richard Hadley-like, it was like, wow, he's up there, and we're all here trying to do something different. I went and saw Tony Hurley at the sales on, on Sunday and I told him, I said, Wolfie passed away last night. I said, what was he like as a driver? And Tony's the least dramatic person I've ever met. He just looked at me straight in the eye and said, phenomenal. And when you hear our most successful ever driver talk in that sort of terms and in that way about someone who helped helped form him and what Tony's done to form the Dexters of the world, you realise that, that this is not just a family dynasty for the Wolfenders because, of course, Ross, his other son's driven 7,500 winners in the US, but this is something that permeates through the entire industry, Greg. So forever there will be the legacy of Peter Wolfenden in New Zealand harness racing, but there's also the romance of an era that came well before you and I and for many of our viewers, and that is the bond of Wolfie and Cardi. The mighty Cardigan Bay taking out the 1963 New Zealand Cup. 14 premierships, over 1,760 wins when they used to race once a week and basically take the winter off. A remarkable horseman, four-time New Zealand Cup winning driver. Of course, he drove the mighty Armalite Michael, who he referred to on a couple of occasions, one that I saw a late clip of where he thought Armalite was in the same conversation as Cardigan Bay, which is an enormous thing to say, given she sat parked and won a New Zealand Cup. Obviously, he didn't drive her on that occasion, but uh, yeah, he'll be long remembered. I've got a couple of occasions to sit down and have a chat to him, a quietly spoken man, but um, yeah, like you say, what Tony said, uh, an outstanding driver, probably right up there, uh, only second behind Morris Holmes in terms of premiership who won 18. Yeah, and they're, they're the big three. I mean, obviously, you know, Morris Holmes, Peter Wolfenden, that line through Tony Hurley. And, 
and that extends to Dexter, who over the weekend was crowned the fourth for the fourth time the US champion driver. So that lineage is important. And it's a funny thing, Greg, it ties in really interestingly to a conversation I've had a lot recently. A lot recently I've had conversations about the GOAT and the greatest of all time and people banding around that humans, trainers, horses are the greatest of all time. And people say to me, what does it matter? Can't we just have hype around harness racing? There's a reason it matters. There's a reason it matters because Cardi matters and Wolfie matters and Morris Holmes matters. And when people start banding around the goat about horses or people who aren't, it's really important because the, the history of harness racing and that esteem and the way those people were looked at and the aura they created in the sulky for punters who love them so much. But in the driver's room, the way they were respected matters, Greg. And it also matters that we don't try and pretend that every horse who comes along is Cardigan Bay because that's disrespectful to Cardigan Bay. Um, to Glenn and to Ross and, and to Julie, his children, uh, but to also to Lois, of course, uh, Peter's wife, um, our condolences to you all and thank you for sharing Peter with us. As I said, wasn't a huge part of my personal life, but what he did in a standard he set, Greg, uh, will forever be part of my work life because I get to see the fruits of that every day. So for our, for our industry, Greg, we owe Peter Wolfenden, Cardi, and that entire era and that magnificent story so much. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why we led the show with it today. He thoroughly deserved that. Right, moving on to what's been unfolding in the last four days. New Zealand bloodstock sale, Karaka on Sunday. Results-wise, pretty much on a par with the previous year, Michael. I know the clearance rate has gone up. A very big sale for Brecon Farms. Uh, you know, when the, they sell the two top lots, uh, the Captain Treacherous good-looking girl, Philly, of course, uh, to Charles Joseph Limited. So heading towards uh, Woodlands and uh, the El Mac Colt to Stonewall, who had such a big part to play on all four days. It was a sale, Greg, which is much of the same, but different. And much of the same wasn't the people buying the horses, the same five or 10 people, and they were incredibly important to the industry. Steve Stockman, Stonewall Stud, the Woodlands people, um, the Dean Shannons of the world, you know, the Lincoln Farms, all those sort of people, they're really important. And it's so great to have them as part of our industry. So that part more or less stayed the same. We could do some more of them. The part that changed was the move towards that Captain Treacherous, some beach somewhere, Captain Crunch type blood. And when I say some beach somewhere, I'm talking about the lineage coming through them. Because Karaka has been totally dominated by Better's Delight for, for so long now, it feels like he owns the joint. But Obviously, Better's Delight can't be at the top all the time because he now has hundreds of mares on the ground and they have to go to different stallions. And Captain Treacherous seems to be the one. And Captain Crunch, his son, through that, Greg. What you're seeing is with the Better's Delight, you were seeing a smaller model of horse. People were happy to buy them, even if they were dopey looking, because they knew they would fire up on the track for them. Different type of breed coming through on the other side now. We've seen a bit of it with Art Major in the past. That stand up straight, really big chesty, crested neck, nice decent wither type of a horse, which Captain T leaves and Captain Crunch leaves. Now we've seen it before with Christian Cullen and we've seen it before with Art Major and sometimes it worked with really good horses, but other times they were more speedy and not as tough. Whether we see that with Captain T and Captain Crunch, we, we yet to find out. But we're absolutely seeing high class, very fast, very good racehorses, maybe led by Captain Ravishing, obviously, you know, catch a wave, we'll, we'll see them later, and Millwood Nike. So I think we're seeing a change, and that's by no means being disrespectful to better. He just can't obviously cover his own mares, and Greg, the breeders had to go looking for something else. And they want those big, fast, Strong. rah rah type yep. horses, and I think they've found at least a couple of the stallions who are going to produce them.
Yep, I think you're absolutely right. To Christchurch and the top lots out of uh, day two. Uh, the full, of course, to Muscle Mountain, who was so good last week, winning in record time, breaking his own record, 130,000. Uh, Laura Smith there with three of the top five lots. Uh, Greg and Nina Hope, not surprisingly, buying that one. Tony Hurley outlaying 100,000. For the son of Muscle Hill, tactical landing out of the San Diego uh, Colt. And uh, then we see familiar uh, mares that haven't been gone for too long, Michael. One over Kenny, one over to Stars, Masandai, all Group 1, you know, the Group 1 blood there. That's what people are after. And uh, whilst it was disappointing, the trotting sale overall, um, there'll be some changes there, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was good to see those sought-after lots still very much in that category. Yeah, probably even more so than the paces, Greg, what we're seeing is that the good trotting mares will produce good good trotters, with some of the pacing mares that can be a little bit hit and miss. But, but clearly that sale needs to move into the general sale. Uh, that there was too much of a tail there. It's very simple to explain to people. If you're buying horses, when you have a trotting only sale, and you have these trotting fillies who not many people want because there's not a great deal of residual value until they're proven on the track, when you're selling horses for 10, 15, 20, 10, 15, 20, 10, 15, 20, or worse, they're being passed in at that, it's really hard to go 60, 80, 100. It's really hard mentally, Greg, for people to make that jump. So when you put those horses into the, the general sale, which ab absolutely has to happen, it was worth doing the Monday yep. sale, but it hasn't worked. And then what happens is they're getting among the paces where the average is 50 and it's 50, 60, 70, 40, 60. Then you have a trotter come along and someone goes, oh, I can pay 20 or 30 grand for this. That's okay. That seems reasonable in this market. But when you put that market in isolation, the numbers are too small and it doesn't gain any traction. So there's a little bit to be said, Greg, for sales companies stacking the book and not just doing it alphabetically. It may not sound fair, but putting a couple of lots early to set the market. They're not going to do it. But I'll tell you what, in the normal world they would. But I, I reckon an easier way to solve it is move the Monday into against the paces and just see something go 230, 240, and then all of a sudden paying 18, 20, 30, 40 for these trotters seems perfectly normal. Yep. Because at the moment, Greg, in a micro com, a, a mic, microclimatic sort of market of their own, it just doesn't work. No, it does not. One man who had a great sale, though, got a chance to chat to him on Trotting Sale Day was Taffy Limited's Todd Anderson. Well, it's been a tough day for many, but you'll be pretty wrapped. Yeah, thanks, Craig. It has been a tough day, but, you know, we've been lucky enough to have a couple of nice articles that have been rewarded. So, nice families and uh, gone to good trainers, so that's good. Yep. Every time Muscle Mountain steps on the track, the value of your filly went up, I think. Yeah, we were pretty lucky. We were wrapped when we did get a filly out of the, the mare when we bought her. So, she was a nice filly. It's always hard letting those go, and especially with Muscle Hill, you know, no more semen sort of things. So... Anyway, it's gone to nice trainers and they'll do a good job, so I wish them all the best. Yeah. Well, it's gone to Greg and Nina, I hope, so they know a thing or two about yeah. the breed. Um, uh, and then Lot 179, the tactical landing out of San Diego Love. Yeah, he was a real standout foal, to be fair. And we, tactical landing, Muscle Hill's son out of a beautiful mare by Vereen. Some people say best trotter the world's ever seen still. So, um, yeah, he's come through really, really foal, nice type, and there's not many of them about. Um, but you know, we sold a nice filly at a petite one by Tactical Landing last year to Barry Purden, great trainer again, and very lucky in that since we're going well there. So there seemed to be quite a bit of interest in them. Yeah. yeah. I tell you what, the horses were beautifully prepared by Laura too. Yes, she does an outstanding job, and it starts right from you know breeding them. She breeds them ears and then folds them down, and you know we only see them a few times, even though they're our horses. But you know you're out there and you can touch the foals in the paddock, and the earlings come up to you. So it's just a real credit to her. she's a great lady. Yeah. Congratulations again. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, and he had a big uh, time of it in amongst the pacing sale too. Let's go to the stats from the first day from there. And uh, the bidder's delight out of Heart of Dixty. Price bloodstock to the fore as they have been uh, on so many occasions. Barry Purden getting the one he wanted. 240000 there. The Amazing Dream family, 190000 out of Shard Farm. There's the details out of day two and uh, almost three and a half million, that average there of 51,000 and that clearance rate, I can tell you, has gone up slightly uh, as well out of day two from Christchurch. And uh, on to the last day of the sale where, well, it was a pretty good uh, sale day as well. Here's the top lots from there. 
Uh, Peter Lagan standard breads heavily involved. The Jamelis from WA getting a uh, number of those horses. Stone will obviously hugely involve. Laura Smith with the top two lots there, 234. The betters out of Safedra, which of course was uh, Todd Anderson's. Paul Remwick, uh, Paul and Pauline there with the betters delight out of Louisiana Bell. Midfrew again going to Australia to be trained uh, by the Reeds. And Kentucky, Anna buying the first lot on the last day. Piccadilly Princess's family there, uh, the vendor being Sprayden Lodge. And he was called Captain Commodore because uh, the people from uh, the Commodore Hotel, of course, raced that horse and also Piccadilly Princess. So there's a summary of those uh, top lots. Uh, now let's get to the boss of New Zealand Bloodstock for his take on this year's sale. Andrew, going into the 2023 National Yearling Sales, there was a little bit of trepidation there, and it was probably warranted. Yes, it's trying times at the moment. The economy is not flying, as we know. I think that recession is starting to kick in, and uh, the New Zealand has spent significantly less at the galloping sales, so, so we're a bit, little bit nervous. But you know, the first eight crack went pretty well, and now we're here nearly, nearly the end of uh, the Christchurch sale. And, all in all, I think we're pretty happy. Yeah, let's go back to that Auckland sale and to be basically on a par with the previous years, got to be a, a pass mark. I've got to remember that last year's sale was a record, best ever sale, so we've ended up doing the second best sale that New Zealand uh, Bloodstock's been involved with. Um, average $60,000, which is very, very close to last year's average, and what a great sale the Breckens had, clearing over $2 million, and it just uh, proves that the investment in those wonderful mares has paid off for them. And speaking of vendors, uh, the likes of Bodine Breeding having a 100% clearance rate, obviously Taffy Limited who are a significant player here and at a number of the top lots, um, you know, brilliant to see that. Yeah, we just see Todd, Todd Anderson average $200,000 with uh, two colts, so late in the day here on the final day, so that's fantastic. Bodine uh, have had a wonderful sale too, as you say. Yep. What about uh, the biggest buyers, and, and we know Stone will have come to make a mark in the last couple of years, to be close to 30 yearlings is quite remarkable. Uh, incredible. I just love it when I see uh, Steve over there put his hand up, and um, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, he spent over $2 million, which makes him one of the biggest buyers in, in uh, New Zealand, uh, Thoroughbreds and, and Standardbreds. It's a wonderful contribution he's made again. Right. We're talking positives, but if we go back to the trotting sale on Monday, it has to be a negative. Um, basically, of the 60-odd yearlings offered, only half was sold, and um, that's providing you not only with some challenges, but likely to be some change? It was a tough day on Monday, um, that trotting sale, so we, we're not going to hide, hide that fact. Um, yeah, so next year there will be some changes. We've already talked to many buyers and vendors, and it's pretty common uh, talk around the, the grounds, Greg, and you would have heard it, that uh, we'll, I think we'll combine the trotters back with the paces next year, and I'd love to condense the sale up too. I think the three days is just too long, so I'd like to condense that up, maybe trim a few off the bottom, and, and, and look to have a two-day sale and, and put the trotters back in with the paces. All right. Fifth sale for you guys. Um, gee, it's come a long way in such a short time, and are you very proud of your team, and you know, on behalf of the industry, thanks for, for lifting the bar, so to speak, and um, yeah, congratulations on another wonderful week. Thanks, Greg, and uh, we're loving our involvement, and uh, we're here to stay, and uh, thanks for, for your input too over the last three days, and uh, let's uh, bring on 2024. Yeah, Andrew Seabrook there. Pretty happy, Michael. Uh, it would be remiss of us not to talk about what Stone will have uh, unveiled again. I think about 29 yearlings split, something like 12 fillies, and the, the balance in Colts, and close to two and a half million dollars. Um, it's left an indelible mark over the last two or three years and as Andrew just said then, he loves seeing uh, when Steve starts getting involved in the auction. Yeah, and, and a lot of those horses, they syndicate to people, Greg, so it's not just you know people who, they, they, you can't be part of it. You know, this is a big, big machine, but you can get out there and get a share of these horses and they'll be trained on a beautiful property, which will soon become more beautiful properties. Uh, it's a really big deal, and to Steve and Jill and, and, and second Steve, um, it's wonderful. So uh, they're going about their business in a, in a great way, and uh, it's really important for the industry. So too is New Zealand Bloodstock. I, I worked with them during the galloping sales, and that was six days of grind. It's really hard. It was bloody wet. It was just, they'd be exhausted. When you go through those processes, like Cup Week at Addington, you're exhausted afterwards. I wasn't, because I didn't do much. But they did because they're also doing this enormously over a period of months, huge amounts of workload and into parades and, and the gallops are so big, Greg, that when you head to the harness sales two weeks later, 
you know, they must have been buggered. And they've turned up and the level of professionalism between the two hasn't dropped. There was nothing I saw at the standard bread sales which made me go, oh, that, that's not good. The gallopers did that better. It, it was really well done. So that, that's a big deal. So I think um, a lot of people deserve credit for this. Yes, with interest rates going up, it was going to be hard to keep parity, and they managed to keep parity, which is excellent, because the gallops aren't going to be able to do that, Greg. It, it, no. Probably at any sale coming up anywhere. So a very successful week in the terms of the way the world is at the moment. Uh, and I also like seeing some of those younger guys, Regan Todd picking up good colts, Nathan Williamson, those sort of people. I didn't get a chance to read all the results and I wasn't there in crisis like you were, but um, you know the Arna Donnelly type people, these people getting horses, which is crucially important, Greg, because you know, we need people in that 30 to 50 bracket also purchasing because a lot of the young owners want to race with people their own age. I, th I thought a very, very strong week and not much to complain about apart from that trotter sale, which as Andrew said, they will action very quickly. Yep, well that wraps up uh, the New Zealand Bloodstock sale. Great supporters of the show they are and uh, we look forward to the 2024 sale. On the other side of our first break though, we'll go back to Cambridge from uh, last Friday night because those that purchase this year will be hoping to achieve what a couple of them did last Friday. Welcome back into your box seat. Yes, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Cambridge last Friday night, couple of big races. The first of those, the $200,000 New Zealand Bloodstock Harness Million. Here's the two-year-old winner, Merlin, getting to the outside. Tough thing to do. It is at Cambridge. Get Aaron White to bring them home. And then we'll hear from the winning driver, Zachary Butcher. Dashing now, sooner the better. Merlin down the outside, sooner the better. Merlin, some Merlin magic for the Harness Million of 2023. And the three-year-old Colts and Geldings, he'll get over the top of his stable, mate. Sooner the better. He's just a neat little horse. Yep, I uh, said it before, I'll say it again. He just knows when to put that head in front uh, right on the line. I just watched the replay of it actually and it was dead set right on the line, so I'm yeah. pretty happy about that. What were you thinking a lap out? Because you had to get into the race clearly, but uh, it didn't look like a comfortable watch. What was it like sitting there? Exactly how it looked probably. Uh, I was getting a little bit nervous halfway up the straight, but like I said, you know, with him you, you know he's going to give you everything and he did tonight. Probably, you know, could have done a few things different. Maybe if I got going on my own, I don't cover as much ground around that last bend. That was a, a big talent of uh, when I pulled and looked up, they are actually getting further away from me as I was, you know, running pretty quick quarters. So, yeah, looking at the whole thing after the race, he's gone pretty super. Yep, second harness million. Obviously the first one here at Cambridge. Always special to win a decent race here. And 200,000 is a decent race. Very decent. Uh, I'm always happy with that. Everyone gives me a bit of grief about uh, paying the mortgage and that, but that'll just take a wee chunk out of it. So, yeah, now I'm thrilled. Hey, any big race, any meeting like this, um, these sort of occasions, that's what we're all in the game for. And to come out on top tonight, um, yeah, very lucky. All right. Barry, Scotty, Whip, they've all done a great job with this horse and he presented in beautiful order tonight. Yeah, 100%. You know, I can't thank those guys enough. All the hard work that goes in at home, Barry and Scotty, you know, they always have that horse right in the big races. You know, you, you can never ever doubt them. Um, and, and they just make, make me look good. I'm, I get the easiest job out of everyone. You know, I just got to go out there and point the horse in the right direction. So I can't thank them enough and all the workers. And obviously, um, Dean Shannon, he's been a great supporter of mine. And, um, you know, they just, everyone's so great to work with. Just wrapped to be in the seat that I am, that's for sure. Right, bring on the derbies. Bring on the derbies. Let's hope for a frontline draw next time, eh? <laughs> He's nine from 11, over 300,000. Some really good runs. Sooner the better was uh, excellent. Son of uh, Mac. Uh, what else did we have? Sinbad down the outside. And Michael, the obvious unlucky one, Sherlock, speaking to Blair Orange uh, post-race, and he said, Probably took the wrong option, could have gone inside or outside. Uh, at the end of the day, he said he's a derby horse and I expect him to be more than competitive when those big ones come up. Yeah, I don't think it would have mattered because had he gone outside, he would have ended up back behind Sinbad and he might have been a really booming third or fourth, but he couldn't have won from, from once the race started, he could have won, Greg. There was nowhere Blair could go he could win that race. 
Moolah was really good. I think he's very, very fast, and he seems to want to win Greg. Um, he deserves to be favourite for the derby, with the caveat, of course, that Don't Stop Dreaming's not going to be there, and he, he might be the best of the three-year-olds. But I think there's a fair bit to this crop, Greg. I, I don't think there's any dominant horse that if Merlin draws one to three in the derby, yes, he'll be short. If he draws the second nine, he'll be beatable. Um, Dean Shannon, his owner, puts a lot of money into the game and does so with a smile on his face and is a very, very smart guy. And he could have a massive influence on New Zealand racing in the next 10 years, which may have nothing to do with Merlin. So uh, having a good horse like him owned by a guy who has good intentions for the industry. And then you saw the flow on effect for Barry and Scotty. Um, they Cornelled a sale series race with the Trotters back in October, October the 14th. They then produced this with Merlin and that gives them the confidence, the firepower, and the, the support to go to the sales. And they were big players this week, and Absolutely. that's great, because you want Barry Purden and Scott Phelan and Zach Butcher playing in the top level. You want them playing here, you want them playing in Australia. They're the sort of people you want representing your country with good um, bloodstock, and they've got one in Merlin, maybe two in suit of the better, and a whole bunch more getting on the truck to come home. Yeah, exactly. Uh, of course, he spent about half a million in Auckland, or just under, and bought the heart of Dixie, a uh, $240,000 lot in uh, Christchurch. Uh, unbeaten she is, Millwood Nike is her name. She went round in the $150,000 NZB Harness Million final. This for the three-year-old filly. She found the front, and she was a little bit too good for seclusion. It was really good in Sue Citra. Co-trainer Nathan Purden spoke to us post-race. This pacing princess, she'll make it nine from nine. She's a jewel harness millions winner. Her name, Millwood Nike. They're not easy races to win, but it felt pretty easy. Yeah, she seems to make light work of it, Greg, that's for sure. She's uh, probably this time around, she's um, she's sort of buttoned off a little bit as far as being a little bit casual and stuff. Um, she's pretty happy to let them get up next to her, but uh, yeah, Dad said she was cruising at the line. Yep. Look, it's a long season ahead, and it was a very soft win tonight, so when you're winning them in a streak like she is, that's probably how you wanted it to happen. Yeah, for sure. It's a perfect sort of run without uh, getting knocked around too much. Good without meeting the, the best of the best um, first up. It was, uh, yeah, as I say, it was perfect, really. All right. Sue Citra was also pretty good, I thought, a maiden taking on the quality of Millwood Nike. Um, she was brave after working? Yeah, definitely. She's uh, probably a filly that I think in, in six months' time she'll be a little bit better again. Just hasn't had the foundation of uh, of those sort of horses as yet, um, realistically, kind of her first start. So, um, you know, she's come a long way in a short time. The Steves, uh, Burns, uh, and Thompson, Bruce Irvine, the Endicotts, Frank and Shane, they paid 75000 for her. She's up over $400,000 now, Michael Guerin, and uh, she's the pick of them at the moment. Clearly, she's nine from nine, and she's always looked like an Oaks-type filly. <laughs> Doesn't she just? I mean, mm. We've been blessed to have so many great fillies in the last 20 years. Obviously, adore me being the best of them, but when you go back, you know, even the Venus Serena type horses, there's just so many of them, good Carabella, and and it's really hard to say she's better than any of them. Obviously she's not better than Adore Me, because Adore Me was a freakish three-year-old yet, but man, she's good. Um, Oaks has written all over her, it's something that's gonna need to go wrong for her not to win a couple of Oaks. I, I don't really take much out of that race, apart from the fact that she's happy and healthy. I mean, seclusion's only a maiden, albeit a very good one. Quite a weak field because Advance Party wasn't there. She'll go to Cambridge on Friday. And Carlua Flyby wasn't there because she was at Menangle. So glorified trial, worth a lot of money. Um, nothing you can do about that because that's the way the calendar's falling and obviously sales series races can be that way. We already love her. We might love her a whole bunch more by the time we get to the New Zealand Oaks, Greg, which is still 10 months away. <laughs> That's how long this horse is going to be three, four. I'm still getting my head around it, but she's not going to race in the New Zealand Oaks, Greg, for another 10 months. No, the Northern Oaks, I think, is about the 24th of March, so that'll clearly be the next target. I think the week before there's uh, the lead-up, the ladyship or something like that, so uh, that's when we're likely to see her again. But, uh, yeah, she's pretty exciting, but you're right. Uh, the depth to that race, seclusion actually goes to a maiden uh, at Cambridge on Friday night too. Uh, Rosie was outstanding in the group race, the uh, group three. This is the Breeders, of course, H.R. Fishens and Son, 
Well, in front, rolling, Dylan Ferguson, his partner Joe Stevens, who we're going to hear from uh, once they hit the line. Absolutely delighted, double delight, was storming home though. Double delight, won't be able to get Rosie. Rosie gets the hat trick and a brilliant win in the HR Fiskin and Sons Northern Breeders. Well, you've had nearly 24 hours to reflect. That was a huge buzz, wasn't it? Oh, enormous. I just, I still can't quite believe it. The winning performance of Rosie, of course. She's really struck form and, and a trotting mare in form. We saw her at her best. Yeah, they say, you know, when they're in form, they're in form. I, I thought last night could be the undoing of her with horses on the tapes behind her and stuff. She's a bit of a, a rattlehead at times, but uh, she stepped and off she went. Look, she's a six-year-old, so clearly she's taken time, as often the stock by peak do, and you've had to ride her and, and coax her into to putting her best onto the racetrack. Yeah, there's been, you know, a joint effort from a lot of us. You know, Dylan and I and Peter uh, has played a big part as well. Um, we've tried lots of different things with her. Of course, she won her first start a few years ago now, it feels like, and um, uh, taken a little bit of time since. But I, I found the riding really just keeps her settled and um, happy, and that's probably the key to her, really, um, keeping her happy, as as same with most women. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you've, you've had your licence now for a, for a few seasons and um, you've strived to get horses into group races. Now you're a group race winning trainer. That sounds pretty good. It sounds fabulous, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> What's it like, um, and, and we know how much you do in the social media world, so, so now when you're on the other side of the camera, if you like, and, and watching the race, are, are you a nervous watcher? Yep. Um, I People come up to me like in the first lap and I said, look, I just want to watch this alone, please. I don't want to talk to you during the race. And uh, I just wasn't expecting that result, though, to be honest. It was just a dream come like true. Yeah, and of course, first group race winning drive for Dylan as well. So all the stars aligned. Oh, absolutely. It was just amazing to be able to do it together. You know, Dylan's had a few opportunities in group races and got very close to winning one. I definitely didn't assume that... I would be the trainer of his first uh, group winning drive, but just made it so much more special to um, to do it together. Yeah, well, I could see what it meant to you on the night, and we want to thank you also for everything you do doing social media wise. It certainly, uh, you know, we, we respect it and love having it on our show. So, um, congratulations on both fronts. Uh, thank you. I enjoy, you know, bringing all those moments and milestones to everyone else, but it was cool to have my own last night as well. <laughs> Yeah, she's a breath of fresh air, Michael. Congratulations uh, to Jo. She's a big part of the northern scene. And uh, Rosie is now four from ten and three on the bounce. Yeah, my favourite win of the weekend uh, of either code. I was absolutely stoked for, for Jo and, and also for Dylan and to a lesser degree, Peter, because it's been a bit of a team horse. Um, she's just a really nice, intelligent, pleasant young lady who, and when people are like that, often you can discount their horse person qualities, but clearly they, they can train. She's done a really good job with horses which probably aren't that sexy, Greg, to be honest. She's had a few few horses go through the barn which have been second stringers from other people and cast-offs, and she's done a good job. But you can't underestimate what it does having a younger person available on social media. A lot of the racing media are like you and me. They're, they're on the other side of 40. So to have someone like Joe go out there and tell those stories and some of the great footage we saw with Zach Butcher driving in the cart and commentating during a race, I think it's really cool stuff. So yeah. she's doing a lot for the industry without getting a lot of financial compensation for it. So to see her get that was really cool. And I, you can see how much it meant to Dylan. Obviously, they're a team and a partnership. But go back to the sales, Greg. It's a funny thing. Now Rosie, which is something you probably wouldn't have thought you'd say two months ago, is a horse who, when she goes to stud, will be able to take a trotter somewhere and you would go, oh, I remember her, she was talented, she was pretty good, you know. She's actually given herself, Greg, with that proper black type, not the two minute black type, it's another conversation, the proper black type, Greg, she's given herself a future. Have they not changed that yet? I thought they might have after your rant last week. Well, but... I'll tell you the one other thing we should change, Greg, and we're not gonna get distracted here, the naming of yearlings. Yes. You mentioned a horse before, Captain Commodore, or whatever it's called, a great name, whatever you want to do with it, but why are we still in Well, heaps in the sale book didn't, um, yeah, yeah. and actually Todd Anderson, I did notice his, no, that just says Colt, yeah. which is, I, I think it's right. Yeah. Mate, why waste names on horses who may not make it to the May race? not even get there, yeah, fair point.
Uh, Rosie story. goes around Friday night too. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's in about race number three. Another horse that's in on Friday night at Cambridge is Jimmy Churi. This is a decent sort of field. Uh, racing really well, this horse. James Stormont on, on this occasion. I think Alicia picks up the drive uh, this week. Alicia Harrison. Major Perry's in there. Smithy's Terror. Uh, Bark is uh, rough and ready. It's a, it's a decent sort of a race, Michael, but yeah. Jimmy Churi's a decent horse. Tough race. Mobile mile around Cambridge. Bark could try and lead them. Who knows what Smithy's Terror will do? I mean, he's coming out of the New Zealand Cup. Big jump up from beating Rough and Ready to the New Zealand Cup horses. So, yeah, I found it a really confusing race, and so much will depend on who leads, and I have absolutely no idea who that will be because it depends on the attitude. If Bark gets off the great gate well, whether he wants to hold, whether he doesn't want to hold, we saw Chimmy Churi hand up there, Greg, which I wouldn't have ever thought I would see in that situation. So, really interesting race. Zero idea what's going to happen. Yep, looking forward to that on uh, Friday night. It's actually a double header. The uh, Waikato Bay of Plenty Harness Racing Club racing on Sunday as well. This is a little bit like the Joe Stevens segment, really, because I had a chat to her about the Battle of the Breeds. Joe, a special day coming up on Sunday, the Battle of the Breeds. Yeah, we're looking, really looking forward to that. The second time we've run it. Last year went missing due to COVID, obviously, but uh, it was a really cool day last time, so we're looking forward to um, giving it another crack. Yeah. Give us a bit of a background as to what's involved, and, and it is a good battle between the standard reds and the thoroughbreds. Yeah, so um, the main focus of it is an equestrian event in the infield between races, which is a three phase, and we just have uh, a team of standard reds, a team of thoroughbreds, and they do some flat work and some jumping and uh, in front of the crowd, and we do a big presentation and overall scores, and um, just cool to have the off the track heroes you know showcased on race day yeah and, and that's the background to it it's the horses that have raced and and showing what can happen and give them giving them a life after racing yeah definitely um that's you know our being our main focus of course i'm a hero educator as well for hrnz so um cool to just uh, be showcasing the ridden standard reds but of course you know thoroughbreds to just show what they can do and what happens with them once they finish racing i think it's important for the public to see that um, you know, but awesome for them to see it at the same time as they're watching the races. So yeah. that's that was our motive behind it all. And Cambridge being such an equine epicentre, if you like, of, of New Zealand racing for both codes. Um, yeah, it's the right place to have it, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And of course, we have some uh, great riders. We have jockeys involved in the day and everything. Uh, it's going to be really exciting, and uh, can't wait to hopefully pull it off. <laughs> yeah, it should be good fun uh, there on Sunday. Of course, uh, Alexandra Park racing there last Friday. We've got an update on where things are at. They're looking to be back as we get some footage through, some pictures through from John Denton, uh, the removal of, uh, gee, so much material, Michael, and the relaying of the track. Um, it's been a really big operation. They're expecting to be back at the park on the 3rd of March, which is pretty close. Yeah, and earlier than I thought, Greg, because it, it really didn't stop raining in Auckland until last week. So I have no idea how much work goes into this. I know it's a lot, but it's way more than my little brain can comprehend. Uh, well done to everybody for getting on top of it, for getting the resource and for getting the machinery, Greg, because as we know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the North Island at the moment where this sort of machinery is required. So. Uh, yeah, look, I think it's great that they've been able to get on top of it so quickly and turn things around because it feels, Greg, like months since we've had decent harness racing in Auckland. I know I shouldn't say that because it hasn't been too long, but it feels that way. Yeah, it does. And, and you need to reconnect with people because very quickly, we're going to get into this, Oaks Derby, the race, self-assured here, Cooters here. You know, we need to get these things racing and... and get people re-engaged, Greg. It's the biggest economy in New Zealand and we need people in Auckland to remember this is going on because before too long, we're gonna have an Auckland Cup, a Taylor Mile and a Messenger. So yeah, to everybody involved in that, well done. Um, Greg, just looking at those picks, man, that's a lot of work. Yeah, it was. Uh, 1,300 tonnes of contaminated material had to be taken off the track before they started uh, relaying it. So yeah, a massive job and uh, congratulations to all involved 
in that. Addington Raceway race on Thursday night. We're recording this on Thursday because of the sales, so not really much point if you uh, wanted to preview those races because may well be watching this post them, but my moment's now hard to beat. Coral Valley Stars racing in a pretty good sort of a race uh, to one change starting off uh, the 10 metres, so um, yeah, good luck to Addington on Thursday night. Big day for Ashburton on Sunday, uh, Saturday rather. It is uh, their Legends Day where they're inviting all the people who've been involved in the area to come along and it's their cup day as well. Sam's Town's the horse we want to have a look at. Uh, excellent run, uh, this was on the 75th Jubilee Day uh, down there for the Rangiora Classic and I thought it was excellent. Homebush Lad, geez, a phenomenal horse. He's just had an amazing Country Cups campaign. Buckskin was also very good at. That's Sam's Town getting uh, home late in the piece. But um, yeah, looking forward to the Ashburton Cup on uh, on Saturday. Should be a terrific contest, I would say, Michael, and the likes of Terry and uh, the Falcon and yeah, Buckskin, as I mentioned, uh, all in that. So good luck to the club there on Saturday. All right, we're about to take another break here on your box seat. Not close to, uh, getting pretty close rather, to your home straight where we'll try and find you a couple of winners over the weekend. In your home straight in your box seat, of course, it is the qualifiers for the Miracle Mile this weekend out of Menangle on Saturday night. Kiwis represented by the Telfer Cullen team and also the Dalgetty team. Got a chance to catch up with both sets of connections at the sales. Here's what Steve Telfer had to say, not only about the runners in those qualifiers, but they have the favourite for the New South Wales Oaks. Well, you guys have got pretty serious about Sydney this year. Yeah, look, we have. Yeah, it was, um, the program fitted in well, and the timing with the races here fitted in well. So uh, the horses were working well. So we've um, we've gone over. We've had some mixed luck, but um, everything seems well, and we're looking forward to a big weekend. All right, you've got Group One success on the radar with your very fine filly Kalua Flyby, and she's done nothing wrong on the trip so far. No, no, she's built in nicely. She's had two nice runs. Um, got better with each run, sharper. Uh, Mandy said she uh, couldn't be more pleased with the way she settled in with the heat over there over the last uh, couple of weeks. But um, a whitish draw, but uh, she's a very adaptable filly and um, I think Tim's got a lot of options from that barrier. Sky Blue and Peaceful were hard to get past last week, or last time, and they've got better barrier draws this week. Are they the two to beat again? And the 24 is the key, isn't it? Yeah, well it is. The 2400 was the key. I think um, looking from what I saw from the heats, um, Probably a lot of local horses didn't see out the 2400 real strong, so um, you know I thought our filly got to the line good. I know she's uh, she's come on from then, and um, you know I think she's able to do whatever's needed to get the job done. So uh, Tim Tim was wrapped with her. He said she relaxed well, and um, he thought she still had a bit to offer at the finish. Yeah. The two big boys take their place in the key lead-ups and, of course, the automatic qualifying races for the Miracle Mile. Uh, BD Joe just got things wrong at Newcastle and obviously hitting the discs is not ideal. No, no. They, um, Luke said that they, some horses can do that around there, but he was uh, smashing the wheel discs, which is uh, unusual. It's the same card he had in when he went 150 and 1, but um, yeah, Luke just said Newcastle track can do that. So, um, yeah, we'll turn the page on that and we'll, um, we'll move forward. But... Um, yeah, Manny reports he's really well, um, you know, he's, he's working tremendously well and um, a wide barrier, but um, look, I think within, with a bit of luck he's good enough to get into it. Yeah, well, I know you think he's a serious winning chance in the Miracle Mile, an ultra wise guy, well, he had no luck in the Newcastle Mile, he looked to be bold. No, no, that's right, Luke was, Luke was wrapped with him, he said um, if he thought if he could get a split he would, would have been hard to beat, um, but that, that is ultra wise guy, he's got to be driven a little bit that way and... Um, can't really work overly hard in his races, so um, sometimes he's going to look look a bit unlucky. But um, the wide draw, um, the wide draw really hinders his chances a wee bit. He'll he'll rely on a, a fair bit of luck through the run. Right, you're also taking Alter Meteor over there for the heat of the Derby. Off the back of his performance behind Merlin last week, a what did you make of that? Clearly, it was good enough. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gone. Yeah, look, initially I was a wee bit disappointed. I thought he might have shown a little bit more spark when he came out of the 1-1. One -one. I thought James drove him really well, gave him a great trip. Um, but, um, you know, back at the stables, um, 
he did blow up a bit and he was blown. It looked like he was still on the way up, to be honest, um, which surprised me a little bit. He'd done plenty, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, he's bright and well and full of himself. So um, yeah, we have, with a lot of the big big guns missing from this year, we just thought it was a good opportunity since we were over there anyway. So um, yeah, no, really pleased with him, man. He said he's taken or oh, only half a day to settle in, and um, now he's doing really well. So um, the one draw really, really helps him. Great to catch up with Steve Telfer regarding the Stonewall team in Australia. Here's Cran Dalgetty on the Kentuckiana Lodge team. Cran, an attack on the Miracle Mile, probably went slightly awry when the barriers came out. Krug outside front row. Yes, we're going to have to give them all a head start. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge naturally, but uh, someone's going to draw out there. It's just uh, sometimes at the draw it was our bad luck and someone else's good luck. But uh, no, that's only a starting position, not the finishing one. Yeah. How does it, how's he settled in over there? Well, because he's travelled more than me, um, he jumped off the plane and he was sort of like he's back at home again. So, yeah, he's only about a three day recovery from where some others are a wee bit longer because of his practice he's had. What are your expectations then? What needs to unfold? Because there's plenty of speed in this race. Yeah, well basically the key is we've got to run the first three to, you know, to make the cut-off, so if we can get past seven and uh, at the finish it'll be great. So, uh, yeah, to, we have to probably make our own luck and be a wee bit aggressive with him. You know, we sit back and we can't sprint some fancy quarter, so yeah, we'll be driven a wee bit aggressive. I know Republican Party's on the ballot in both of the automatic qualifying races, but if he doesn't get back in, he's in race one, a race that he can win. Yes, we actually wanted to go in the lesser tier. Sure, I'd love to say he's as good as them, but the six rate, you know, we're a bit powerful than him. So if we get some small fish, it'll be a bonus. And off the back of his run last week in the chariots, effectively he was out of play being last at the half. Yes, it was sort of a bit of a non-event, unfortunately. I hate to go to an event and take defeat, but we'd had to do that. So we just turned the page and looked for our next race. All right, let's get into the preview of the two qualifying races for the Miracle Mile. Here's Triple Eight. He's doing a great job, isn't he, Michael? Uh, he's 25 to 1 this week. Uh, he storms home and wins at uh, Melton. But you've got Bondi Lockdown in one, Spirit of St. Louis in three, Better Zip It, who's low flying, uh, drawn up in five. So this is going to be a tricky race for BD Joe. Very much so, and any horses who aren't on the marker pegs, because I think there's an opportunity here for Spirit of St. Louis to go forward and lead, and Bondi Lockdown sit on his back, and I think under those circumstances they would run one too. It may not be quite that easily, but I, I think Spirit of St. Louis is quick enough off the gate, and he can lead over a mile. Um, he didn't need to lead an army cup, but that's a story for another day. And they, I think Bondi Lockdown would beat him. Greg, and it'll be incredibly difficult for anything coming wide. So one and three, three and one, probably the one to beat the three. Everything else is going to need an enormous amount of luck and maybe tempo I don't see coming. Better Zip it's been good, but he's also been good in vastly inferior fields to this, and I think that his form line looks better than his recent performances. Yep, so 210 for Bondi Lockdown, 330 Spirit of St. Louis. You're out to $12 for BD Joe. Let's have a look at Torrid Saint and uh, his latest performance. Uh, they went 150.5 in this. That's him in the red colours. And uh, the horse you just mentioned, Bondi Lockdown, stormed home. He's come up with Barrier 1, Torrid Saint. He's a $20 chance in this. Better Eclipse is 350 expensive ego at around $4. Here's Bondi Lockdown really savaging the line. Uh, and then, of course, we've got Ultra Wise Guy. He's a $12 chance. Onalua Bay, $3.20 off the back of his uh, Hunter Cup success. And Krug, the outside draw, pretty cruel for the connections there. He's at around $18, Michael. How did you find the second of our qualifiers, the Allied Express? Well, just to the Kiwi horses, they, they both need a miracle. Um, Torrid Saint has blazing gate speed and he is the likely first leader and then who would he choose to hand up to? I think Better Eclipse, who won the Chariots of Fire last February and is a genuinely good horse. I think he gets across and potentially gets the lead if they want to go hunting for it. If they can't, it will be expected that expensive ego would either try and find the same spot or race outside the leader. So a lot's going to depend on that shuffle early, but I don't think Torrid Saint's going to want to stay in front at Menangle because you're on the second, Greg, you're in the Miracle Mile. Now here's where things get tricky because Onalua Bay's the best horse in the race. The top two are qualified for the Miracle Mile. They go straight in. Two other spots are taken. Uh, Catch a Wave, who was wonderful last week, and Mark Dan. So there's six spots. Now everybody's thinking Captain Ravishing's going to get a spot, which would be great for the race because it'd be really exciting. But what do you do if Honolulu Bay runs third? 
Does Captain Ravishing deserve to go into the race more than Honolulu Bay? Ahead of the Hunter Cup winner? Mm. Then, reverse it. First heat, I cast no shadows in there. What say he runs there? Yep. Can you say Captain Ravishing, and I'm not picking on Captain Ravishing, no. I'm talking about performances. I cast no shadows the Inter-Dominion champion. Mm. Let's go and, back. Uh, and and won the Len Smith yeah. and ran second in the Hunter Cup. Yeah, I know. So who runs third in these races is far more important than runs first and second. They're afraid to complete, they're in. Yeah. Who runs third, Gregory, is really important because there's a general feeling Captain Ravishing has to be in the race. But that means someone from an angle has to go up to somebody who runs third and say, sorry, Got you don't get a start. You don't mm. get a start. We're giving it to a horse who's never won an open class race. Yeah, well, Catch a Wave, of course, beat Captain Ravishing last mm. week. Um, it'd be remiss of us not to discuss this, Michael, because Captain Ravishing was the rave horse going into it. I think he was $1. twenty, and Catch a Wave worked outside him, took a wee trail for a couple of hundred metres and then outstayed him. Yeah, he was great, Catch a Wave. Really, really good horse, well-trained. Best thing happened to this horse was not starting in the Hunter Cup. He starts in the Hunter Cup, he doesn't win this race. Because he hadn't won an open class race. And they wanted to get into the Hunter Cup. And, and Andy's a smart guy. He didn't even go to the Bonanza. He went back to the Mercury over 1,200 metres. And that hard running was good enough to get him fit for this. But he also ran fourth the week before in a prelude to this race. So he's a wonderful horse, and he will eventually end up being a true Grand Circuit horse. No issue with Captain Ravishing. I wasn't bizarrely disappointed in Captain Ravishing at all last week because that's who he is. He's very fast and he's very big. There's a little issue there somewhere. He might need a joint injected. I don't know. I don't get to see the horse on a daily basis. But there's, not, no, there's no pot on Captain Ravishing. No. What he did last week was about as good as he's gone in the past. Catch away just gone better. The problem is he's been beating average horses by big margins in Victoria. But his times, compared with Lock and Barat's times two or three years ago, was significantly down. Now the section was really, really fast because he's big and he's fast and he's strong and he's wonderful, he's a beautiful horse. But the problem was his Bonanza time, had Lock and Bar Art and Self Assured, who Cornell the Bonanza a couple of years ago, had they been in the same race, they would have beaten him. But the gap's so big, people go, oh my God, this is incredible. But it's not that incredible because he's actually not going that quick. He did when he won the, breed, uh, the, um, the Breeders' Challenge, the Breeders' Crown. But Again, you're not beating much. No. And then Captain Wave comes and improves, I've catch, catch a wave, and of course, leap to fame. So that's why I'm happy to leave Captain Ravishing alone. He's a wonderful horse. He might be a great horse. But I wasn't disappointed by what I saw last week. He's just got a little issue somewhere. They'll fix it up because they're really good trainers. I hope he's in the Miracle Mile, but he can't just be given a spot in case on Honolulu reputation. Bay or I cast no shadow run top three because no, clearly totally. they have to go before him. All right, let's move on to the New South Wales Oaks where Carlua Flyby goes round. Here she is. I uh, thought a very good staying performance. Uh, sat three the fence, got to the outside, was too good for uh, Sky Blue and Peaceful who was in second. Uh, she's $2.40. She comes in a couple of spots to barrier eight, Michael. Uh, you've got $3 for Peaceful, $4 for Sky Blue. Those three on that heat, which was significantly faster, I think should dominate the finish. Yeah, great drive by Tim Williams. Um, nervous times, but hit the line really well. She's the filly to beat. I'm actually backing Peaceful. Peaceful was hitting the, the discs on the sulky there, got a bit uncomfortable. I think she'll lead, but I think she'll be really, really hard to beat. Uh, I hope Carlua Flyby wins. If she gets the right run, she probably will. I might even back them both, Greg. But I do think Peaceful is a very good filly. So they're the clear top two. Uh, I think they'll be too good for Sky Blue on what I saw last week. All right, Ladyship, uh, where we have a couple of Kiwi connections. Brave You Kelly, who's been low flying. And, of course, the two-time winner of this race, Stylish Memphis, who comes up with a good barrier draw, Michael, um, inside of both Brave You Kelly and uh, Tough Tilly. Tough Tilly's 280, 324, Brave You Kelly, Kelly. And if you want to back Stylish Memphis in her last race, 650. I can't be on her. I think Brave View Kelly thrashed her last time and she didn't make any real ground. Tough Tilly's a beautiful little girl and she just does such a great job. I think so much depends on who settles where. Man, it's a tricky race because they're drawn so wide and it's really hard to imagine they both just cross them off the gate because it's a group one. The opposition's not going to want that. I don't know what's going to happen, Greg. I'll probably go in Brave View Kelly only because it's 
a Menangle horse who's used to Menangle stuff, but Tuftily's a wonderful horse. And good luck to the stylish Memphis team. I would love to see her go out with a victory, but I I didn't love what I saw from her compared with her best work of, say, two years ago. All right, that wraps up what's happening there on uh, Friday night. Domestically, we, uh, sorry, Saturday night, uh, Addington 10 races on Thursday, 5.15. Cambridge, they race twice. They've got eight races on uh, Friday night and again nine on Sunday starting at 1.25. Wyndham Cromwell, they actually race twice. Friday, a twilight meeting there and then on Sunday. Good luck to them. It's a good horse going down there. Mawanga might start both times and Ashburton, of course, race on Saturday. They're underway at 12.20. Hand milking best bets of the week. Graham Hand, He's gone with uh, Addington Tap McLeod, the five, in race five, and he's gone with Seclusion in race four. I like Kakarangi Blue, top four, $2.20. Happy with that. Michael's gone for Jolimont in race number seven. That wraps up a pretty busy show. Michael, back in our normal slot next week, next Wednesday, where we'll wrap up that Miracle Mile preview stuff and build towards their big race, the Million Dollar Race. Looking forward to it, Greg. To everybody who bought a horse or sold a horse this week, congratulations and the best of luck. The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Harness Link, for your worldwide harness coverage. New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, where winning begins. Brecon Farms, Stonewall Stud. IRT, it's your horse and our passion. Australasian wide Garrard's Horse and Hound. Renwick Farms, Lincoln Farms, Harness Racing New Zealand, and the clubs Addington Ashburton, Alexandra Park and Cambridge.